My name's Dr. Matthew Harrison. And my name's Jess Rollings. Today we're talking about playing for inclusion using cooperative video games to support neurodiverse children in their communities. I'd like to just begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and waters of Australia and pay my respects to all elders past, present and emerging. So my name is Jess. I'm a speech and language pathologist by trade. I now work in research at Melbourne Uni. I'm a colleague with Matt. I have a lived experience of neurodiversity myself. Um, I'm autistic, that was diagnosed when I was 19. And then I got diagnosed with ADHD at 23, which was very, very late. And as I mentioned, my name is Dr. Matthew Harrison. So I'm a teacher and a lecturer at the University of Melbourne. And I research in how we can support learners with autism in our schools and in our communities. Matt and I are both huge gamers ourselves, and we both grew up building our social connections and our friendships through sharing experiences playing the games that we really, really loved. So when we think about social skills, we need to consider which social skills really matter and how can we support students to develop these collaborative skills in a way that celebrates their differences and is comfortable for them as well. There are two main types of social skills. On the left, there are the normalising social skills, these are influenced by social convention and culture. A good example of this is eye contact um, because it can vary across different cultures in the use of it. And it's also part of social convention as well. On the right, we have our functional social skills. These are more purposeful skills and they're good for collaboration. Some good examples of this are taking turns or asking for help. These are really important skills that everyone needs in life. And you'll see in the middle on the bottom, that's my prep photo. That's baby me, um, my first year of school. And I was not ready for the whole world that was ahead of me. So we have two main forms of inclusive play. Matt and I research and implement programs that use cooperative video games to develop collaborative social skills, while also building friendships and a sense of belonging and community for our participants. On the left, we have the virtual playground model, but then on the right, we also have digital game space intervention. These are the two main models and we'll go through these shortly. So the first one of these is the virtual playgrounds model. This acts very similar to a physical playground out in the yard, but it uses the virtual environment. This is student led and interactions are supported by teaching staff when needed. The focus of the virtual playgrounds is really about social connection and a sense of belonging and the community. The great thing about the virtual playground model is that it celebrates the differences of autism and allows neurodiverse players to engage on their own terms. A good example of this is the use of text chat. Some neurodiverse people find it a lot more comfortable to communicate through written mediums rather than verbal. And the good thing about online play is that it does cater for these differences and provide different methods. Digital games based intervention is a structured system for intervention and it's co-designed with students who have neurological differences or disabilities such as ADHD or autism. Student voice is still really, really important in this program, but the teaching staff and allied health workers take on more of an interventionist role to support learning. One way of doing this is through the use of visual supports. These are really good because they're easy to read and they're very concrete. In this model, games create the conditions for collaboration and they promote interaction. Teachers teach the social skills during this model using explicit teaching for skill acquisition and then coach the students through support and play to support the skill performance. Our system for digital games-based intervention uses a three-stage approach. In stage A, we look at using video modelling and video review as tools for skill acquisition. This means players are watching back footage of themselves playing from previous sessions, as well as watching examples of the skills being used by other players. Stage B is about cooperative play and players working together and taking regular breaks to reflect on their practice as guided by the interventionist serving as a coach. Stage C is a process of guided reflection where players look back at what they've just done during cooperative play and the skills they've used, and also looking forward in terms of setting goals for the following session. As this is Games for Change, we also want to talk about the game design that creates the conditions for collaboration. So which game design mechanics or rules of play best create the conditions for collaboration? Well, we actually have done some research around this to understand what are the principles of design that actually help us to create the ideal conditions for either virtual playgrounds or for digital games-based intervention. Using video analysis of a digital games-based intervention program, we identified 39 clear principles that create the ideals for collaboration. These fall within four broad categories of player identity within the team, the rules required to manufacture interaction between the players, 
the impact of level design upon the application of performance of social skills, and game design as an enabler for the inclusion of all players. We're going to discuss some of these principles now. One example of creating the conditions for collaboration through game design is interdependent progress through design constraint. This means that the game forces players to rely on each other to progress through the level or the game. Some examples of this are the use of a single shared screen rather than split screen. This means that all the players have to stay in close physical proximity and work together to maintain that. Another example is the use of puzzles or obstacles that require the involvement of all players to pass through or the distribution of specific abilities amongst players that then forces them to work with the abilities of other players to move through. Also really important is the game feedback on individual and team performance. Players should receive individual level feedback, which is important in them fulfilling their individual roles within the team during the gameplay. So individuals should know how they're going. Feedback related to progress towards the collective goal or the team goal should emphasize team level feedback over individual level feedback. That's things like getting a collective score or collective progress marker on how you're going towards working towards the ultimate goal of the game. Finally, feedback should be accessible to all players using multiple modes of representation and allow for sufficient processing time for players to take that feedback on and react to it. It's also really important that the game mechanics promote leadership and apprenticeship. So the game should support peer coaching by adopting established genre conventions, allowing experienced players to utilize their knowledge to coach novice players. Players should have opportunities to switch between primary and secondary roles within the team. It shouldn't be the same person leading all the time. Finally, play mechanics should allow less skillful players to have a required and regular role in achieving the team goal. And this final one's really important. Everyone's actions should matter within the team. Another important principle is the idea of failure as learning rather than punishment. And this has a collaborative collective element to it. For example, players should have independent individual health bars to ensure that more skilled players are not penalized by less skilled players dying more frequently. When a player dies while their peers are still alive, the player should be able to respawn relatively quickly and there should be an element of player interactivity in this waiting time, such as tapping a button to get them back into the game. Kirby is an excellent example of this. There needs to also be multiple checkpoints within a level so that when all the players are killed, they can return to an area close to where they died so they're not penalized by attempting more challenging sections of the game. This is just a brief overview of our research. Thank you so much for listening today and please reach out if you have any further questions or ideas for future collaborations. Thanks.